Well, good morning. It's a it's good to have you here this morning. Happy Easter if it's your first uh, week to be with us and, and you've never been here before. Uh, am I on? Am I on? You can hear it out there? Okay, cool. It just sounds different up here. I don't know why. Um, anyway, uh, I'm glad you're here. If you're here and it's your first week, we're glad you're here. And if there's uh, at the end of the service, if you have any questions about anything, know that the, the desk out in the foyer there or the, or the connect desk downstairs and we can answer those questions for you, and, and we want to make sure that you uh, know everything about us that you need to know to, uh, to, uh, to feel comfortable. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, 10 days or 14 days ago, I was with a friend of mine at my favorite uh, burrito place in town, and, uh, and uh, this, this was on TV. It seems like every time I go uh, to eat at this burrito place, this is on TV, and it's the only time I watch it. It's my, it's my least favorite show on television. I don't I don't enjoy it. Um, I, I think the premise is stupid. For the most part, if you're walking down the road, say in Bedford, and somebody comes up to you and says, I'll give you 25000 or I'll give you a one in 20 chance in a million, you take the 25000 you, you don't even think about it. You take the 25000 you laugh the whole way away from there, thinking, <laughs> one in because almost certainly if you give a one in 20 chance in a million, it means you have a 19 in 20 chance of not getting anything. So you take the 25000 you laugh about it, and you go on. But people don't do that on the TV show. They, 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 don't, they don't do it. In fact, they act insulted. I was in there once uh, in the burrito shop. Again, it's the only place I watch this, burritos. I, don't, I, I associate it with burritos. When I'm eating the burritos, the, the, the same deal. Uh, they offered like $170,000 to some guy. And again, he slams the button down. I, it's an insult, he says. I, insult me with 100000 Any of you that want to, I'll take that kind of an insult. Every day. Because again, it's crazy. But the reason why they do it, the reason why they do it on the show, and the thing that hooks you on the show, uh, the, the, the reason the show works, is people always believe there might be a better deal out there somewhere. There, there might be this second deal out there, and if I get rid of it on this one deal, this second deal is going to come, and I'm going to wish I would have held out, and, and, and then you miss this really good thing that's in front of you. I found this this week, studying on this, this idea and this theme, to a lady named Terry, um, uh, Terry Horton, and she was a retired semi-truck driver uh, in, in, uh, in California, and in her 70s, she bought the painting that's behind her there. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a dining room table size painting. It's like six foot by four foot. She bought it because she thought it was hideous. She wanted to give it to a friend like as a joke. And so she bought it for $5 and she gave it to her friend and her friend says, that's hideous. I don't want that. And so they all laughed about it. And then, and then Terry, Terry put it for sale in her own yard sale for $5, hoping to get her $5 back. And an art teacher was there, a local art teacher. And, and he says, you know, this looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. And, well, she, and she didn't know who that was, and, and you may not know who that was either, but he paints like that a lot, and, and his paintings can, can be lots of millions of dollars. And, uh, and so she, she, she had somebody look at it, an art expert. She went and had an art expert look at it, and he said, yeah, I mean, everything about this says it's a Jackson Pollock painting, but he didn't sign it, so I don't know for sure if it's him, but yeah, this really looks like one of his. And she took to two or three people, and, and all of them said the same thing. Yeah, if I had to bet on it, I would say for sure, Jackson Pollock painting, but, but I can't prove that it is. I don't know for sure. And, and after like the third or fourth review that she had like that, somebody offered her $9 million for this painting that she had spent $5 for. And she said no. She said no. She said for a Jackson Pollock painting, uh, she said I need at least $50 million to sell it. Uh, and, and so she never sold it. Then she died a few years ago uh, at, 80, at 86, uh, and she never has, still has never sold it because nobody knows for sure if it's a Jackson Pollock painting. And so because nobody knows for sure, they're not going to pay her this big number that she wants. She told her kids on her, on her deathbed, whatever you do, don't take less than what that painting is worth, which I imagine probably put the kids in a pretty tough spot. If it was me, I would have sold it on the way home from the funeral home. I would have, I would have called somebody up. Is the nine million still good? Um, I'll, I'll sell it for eight million if you come get it right now. I would have, and I would have felt great about it. And there's a chance, of course, that you could sell it for nine million, and the person you sold it to might get a lot more for it. But even if they did, you would still have nine million. You know. And, and it just seems like a, but again, it's what we do to each other. I, I read about the same idea, same topic, the Louisiana Purchase. When Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase, that's the part of the, the map in white there uh, from Napoleon, uh, he paid three cents an acre 
for it. Now, there's been a lot of inflation since then, and you may think, well, sure, then three cents. Well, what's it today? It'd be 64 cents an acre today. But all that land for 64 cents an acre, just an incredible bargain. But there were people in Jefferson's cabinet thought, we, oh, we shouldn't do it. He's ripping us off. You know, <laughs> get him down to two cents an acre. You know, you shouldn't do it. It's too much money. And there's always people who want to second guess these things. Really, no matter what you you put out there. Sounds too good to be true. I bet we can get a better deal if we just wait a little bit longer. And, uh, and it strikes me that maybe you could come into Easter Sunday and have some of those same emotions, right? especially if you don't come to church very often, that, that when, the, when the preacher is talking about uh, the, the different things, it can sound like just a bunch of a religious uh, uh, you know, jargon or mumbo jumbo. And, and, and it just sounds like, it, it, okay, I'll wait on that a little bit. I, let me think about that just a little longer. And, 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 and it's just kind of one of those things you're not sure you, you trust people. And if you do take that attitude, I certainly can't blame you for it because I'm like that on most everything. I, I don't do a lot of wheeling and dealing and fine art or anything like that, but I uh, occasionally have to buy a car, and I'm terrible to go buy a car with. Julia won't even go with me when I go buy a car because I'm, I'm suspicious and I'm, I'm angry and I'm sure they're lying to a bunch of liars. I'm sure they're lying. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're, sure they're cheating me. And I've had so many different little bad experiences, and it may have been innocent, you know, but I'm sure they're lying, and I'm sure they're cheating me, and I'm sure they're out to get me. When they leave me, they're going back and laughing with their buddies. Yeah, we took that guy, ha, 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 and I'm just, just ticked off. I'm driving away from the car dealership. I'm mad. And uh, in California, there was a, we were trying to buy a, 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 a minivan, Julia and I were, and we were having a hard time. Uh, and she wasn't with me. It was just me, and it, she wasn't there. My father-in-law went with me, uh, but, but she wouldn't go with me. And we were talking to this guy about, about whether to buy the car. Now, we couldn't get to that middle. You know, I, I had a number I wouldn't go above, and he had a number he didn't want to come below. And we were just having a hard time, you know, finding that, that, that agreed on price. And so finally, kind of to change the subject, you know, he said, hey, let me get, just get to know you better. And I'm thinking, I don't want to get to know you. I don't want to know you. I just want to get this done and get out of here. But let me get to know you better. He says, yeah, you know, uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about yourself. What do you, what do you want a, you know, a van for? You know, why you, why you, why you want to do it? Why, why a minivan? And I said, well, you know, family's getting bigger. And, and I said, we're pretty active in our church. I didn't want to tell him what I did for a living because that changes the conversation quite a bit. So I said, I'm pretty active in our church. Sometimes we give people rides and stuff like that. He goes, oh, which church do you go to? He said. And I, I told him. It was in California. He said, first Christian. He goes, really? Well, that's my church. And I, and I thought, well, that's weird. And I said, I, I, you go there a lot? He goes, yeah, I go there all the time. I, I think I'd have seen you. Are you sure? And I told him where it was and everything. Oh, yeah, I'm there every week. And I thought, you know, it's possible that I wouldn't know who he was, but it's hard to believe that he wouldn't have known who I was if he was coming every week. And so I'm, I'm, I immediately don't trust the guy. I want to get out of there. I See, I told you. I told, I told my father-in-law later, see, they're all crooks. They're all a bunch of liars. And, and that's just how I am. And I, By the way, as a, I don't do with the sermon, just as a finish for that thought, the next Sunday, he did come to our church, and uh, I didn't see him when I came in. I was preaching, and when I saw him, I was preaching, and we made eye contact, and he made this wild face. I can't, I can't really do it for you, but he made this wild face, and, and I preached for a few minutes, and he got up to go to the bathroom, and I never saw him again. That was the end of the... <laughs> Anyway, so but point, but the point. Sorry, I could see how you could you could look at me and say, "Oh, I see, paid salesman. I see what's going on here. I see what you're about. I see the shenanigans that's going on here." And, and it'd be easy to, to to think that maybe I'm going to talk around you or, or try to prove something. Or, or and I and I really don't want to do this. I I I just want to tell you about the trade that Jesus offers. Really, the whole point of the gospel is this trade that Jesus offers. And, and it says, God made him who had no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. The, the, the trade is he takes all of our sin, all of our darkness, all of our mistakes and, and wrongs. And, and, you know, in a room this size, there's probably a few of you who've done some things that would, would be, you know, in your head pretty bad. Things that maybe if the people sitting beside you knew about, you'd be embarrassed. Things that you thought or things that you did or things that you said, things you wish you could take back. And, uh, and Jesus offers to take that, the weight of all that, to pay for it. He offers to, to wash your sins away. And in exchange for taking all your sin, he's going to give you all of his righteousness so that one day when you stand in front of God, uh, you'll have nothing to fear. One day, it's like the Middle Ages, the medieval uh, preachers were talking about wearing a robe of righteousness. 
you'll have this, this robe of righteousness on. You're dressed as Christ, and when you stand there one day, you won't be afraid. You won't be scared. You won't be nervous. God's going to carry you, and God's going to pull you in to that last, that last thing. You know, for most of us, the, the, the fear of what comes next hangs over everything. The fear of, of, of death or of getting older or of dying, it, just, it weighs on us. And, and we can feel uh, uh, every day. Uh, I went to see somebody in the hospital yesterday, just a real freak accident, and, and now they're in, in pretty serious trouble. And, and, and we all know that we're just one freak accident away. And if you get to a certain, like my age, you, you start to notice you know, that some of the aches and pains don't go away as quick as they used to. And, and you can see it in the mirror, this evidence that, that you're getting older and that you're changing and, 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 and it looms out there. And the trade that Christ offers is that one day when we stand with him, we'll be covered in his righteousness and we'll be made holy. And we'll be able to not worry about being good enough for God. That's the trade. And I know it sounds too good to be true. I know it sounds like it's too much uh, to believe in, but, it, but, it's, but that's the bargain, right? That's the, that's the trade. I was talking to somebody a few years ago about this, this thing, and they weren't a Christian, and they did know what I do for a living, and we were talking about being a Christian. And I remember being in a restaurant. We were in a restaurant, we were talking about this thing, and, uh, and uh, we weren't getting any closer, kind of like that car deal thing, I guess. I, I, I couldn't make it make sense to him and he was having a hard time coming to where I was at so I finally said something like well is there is there one part of this like like if I could prove that one part of this was true would you then want to come right across and he said oh no I'm not falling for that because again the car salesman thing I know I see what you're doing there he says hey I can turn that around on you he says he says what is there one part of this that if you knew for sure it wasn't true you'd give up on it and there is an answer for that for me if I if I knew the resurrection wasn't true I wouldn't believe any of it it's the resurrection that, that proves to me every other part of it. That on days when I worry that my prayers aren't working like they should, on days when I, when I feel God is distant, on days when I feel like I don't know enough or I'm not doing enough, I can always reflect back and think about the resurrection and think about Christ coming back from the grave, think about all that power that's now working for me, and think about the fact that it proves that at the end of this life, one day I'll be able to stand up there strong in him, not because of my own strength, but because of his, because of this trade that we made all these years ago. And uh, I said, if that wasn't true, I wouldn't be able to do it at all. To me, the whole message, the whole trade, the whole gamble, the whole gospel hangs on that one thing. And so on Easter Sunday at this church, and really at, at any church you go to on Easter Sunday, that really is the message. We just want to think real hard about the resurrection and think about the, the, the story that Jesus told, uh, that's told about Jesus coming back on that day and, uh, and just let you know what it says. And, and like Brian said in the communion, it's mentioned in four, there's four histories of Jesus in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in those stories, the stories about the resurrection are all pretty similar. And I'm going to pick Matthew, but I could have picked any of them. They all pretty much tell the same story. There's little wrinkles in each one, uh, but they all tell pretty much the same story. And it's this. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and the other Mary is probably his mother, which, but it may, may be somebody else completely. But anyway, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they went to look at the tomb. So after the Sabbath, first day of the week, that's a Sunday. The first day was a Sunday. And, and they go to, 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 to remember Jesus. There were certain uh, uh, traditions you did with, a, with, a, with a, a funeral thing in Jewish culture, and they wanted to do those things. He had been crucified and kind of put in the grave late, on Friday, and they wanted to, to make everything right, and they wanted to grieve. You know, we're right here by a cemetery. Sometimes uh, people will come back after the funeral. Sometimes people come back quite often after the funeral, and we'll sit there by the stone or, or go out there and, and think about the person who's gone, and, and that's what they're doing. They're going to remember him and, and to cry about it and to think about what Jesus meant, and, and, uh, and, and it says there was a violent earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone, and he sat upon it. And his appearance was like, uh, was like lightning, and his clothes were just white as snow. And the angel said to the woman, don't be afraid, or to the women, don't be afraid, for I know that you're, that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, and he's not here. He's risen. 
just like he said. So come see the place where, where he lay. And, and, then, and then go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead and he's going to go ahead of you into Galilee. And there you'll see him and I've, and I've told you. And so the women hurried away. And they were afraid, yet they were filled with joy, and they want to tell the disciples. And, and on their way, Jesus appears to them. And greetings, and, and, they, and, and they are overjoyed again. And it says they, they grabbed his feet, and they, and they worshipped him. And, and he speaks. He says, don't be afraid. Just go tell the disciples to go to Galilee, and they'll see me. And all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all pretty much tell the same story. It was women that were the first ones to see Jesus alive. And... Uh, it was, and if you were inventing a religion, especially inventing a religion in that day, that's a curious detail. You probably wouldn't have had women be the ones to see it first because women weren't seen as credible witnesses. In Jewish culture, uh, couldn't even testify in court in, in, on certain things. But even in Roman culture, it was very much a man's world. And, and, and if you were going to invent something, you probably wouldn't have women be the first witnesses of it both times when he talked when the angel says it and when the when the disciples when the, when jesus says it to uh, to the to the ladies says go tell my disciples so when the angel and jesus both talk to the ladies go tell my disciples well what's well why are there why aren't the disciples there well they're scared they're hiding in, in other gospels we find out that they're behind a locked door they're nervous to even be out there nobody's assuming jesus is going to come back and the disciples are afraid and again it's another curious detail if you were just going to invent a religion, you probably wouldn't have the leaders of the religion scared to death at home, looking like cowards. You'd probably build them up as heroes. You'd probably build them up as people who knew what was going on, people who had some faith, and, and the disciples didn't have any faith. And that's why they were hiding. And so Jesus speaks to the women, and they're scared. Everybody's afraid. Nobody has planned for this. Nobody has assumed this is going to happen. And, uh, and, they're, and, they're, and they're scared, and the disciples are hiding. And, and it's just such a weird start to a religion. There's no army behind it. There's no money behind it. There's no king behind it. Um, it's just a bunch of poor people who have this vision. Later in Galilee... When the, and which is also a weird thing. Uh, uh, they're in Jerusalem. It's like the center of the, the religious world. Actually, maybe even then and now. And, it's like, and, and they say, hey, let's leave Jerusalem. Let's go back to Galilee. It'd be like being in New York City or Chicago. Hey, let's leave all these people. Go back to Bedford. And we'll start our big movement there. It's not that Bedford's a bad place. It's just not where a lot of people are compared to New York City or, or Chicago. And the same thing for these guys. If you're wanting to start a religion, why go back to Galilee? And I think that's all part of the deal. It starts small. It's just Jesus talking to these guys, and these guys talking to other guys, and those guys talking to other guys, and it just exploded. And it all has foundation on this fact that they see Jesus. The, the verse behind me, it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but there were some who, who, who doubted. And this kind of exposes another myth about this. There's, a, there's a, uh, a, a way to dismiss these stories by saying, well, they were just a bunch of you know, yokels. They didn't know what was going on. They uneducated uh, simpletons. They had no idea what things were. And, and so maybe they, who knows what they were seeing. But, but, but they knew, but they knew that it was weird. I mean, even then they knew it was weird. I mean, dead people don't come back. I, when my grandpa died, I was just a little kid when grandpa died. And, 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 and I, I would watch the casket and watch him in the casket. And I kept hoping, sometimes I would think he had twitched or that he had maybe moved a little bit. I was hoping for that, but he hadn't. I'm hoping for it, but it didn't work like that. I mean, so if you lose somebody who's really precious to you. You go in town and you think you see them walking through a crowd, but it's not them. It's just somebody who walked like them. Or you think you hear their voice and you turn around and it's not them. It's just somebody else. And, and you want so badly to believe it. But we know in our heart of hearts that dead people don't come back. And they knew that too. And so some people are looking right at Jesus and like, man, what, what's happening? How, how is this even possible? What's, what's going on? And Jesus speaks to them. He says, I've got a plan, basically. All the authority has been given to me. And so he says, I want you to go out and make disciples. Just go tell them what you saw. Make disciples of all, all nations, uh, 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 baptizing them, teaching them, you know. Let them know who I am and what I'm about. Tell them all the things that you saw and all the things that you learned, and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. You know, because of Jesus, because he came back, we've got a calling to do. And so let somebody else know what we know. 
those 11 guys told other guys who told other guys who told other guys who eventually told you. And here you are. And you still have a calling. You don't want the chain to end with you. You still got things to do. And God wants you to take the message you've been given and spread it. What is that message? Jesus is alive. That changes everything. Jesus is back. I mean, that, 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 that just, I mean that, that, that's the whole message. When you read in the book of Acts, the, there's sermons where these guys would preach in Acts to different crowds. The sermons are real simple compared to sermons today. They didn't quote like a Bible passage. If I would ask one of you to preach next week, you'd go home and find a Bible passage, and you'd, you'd quote that verse, and you might tell us what you thought about it. That's usually how sermons go. They didn't do any of that. They didn't quote any verses. They, didn't, they just got up and said, listen, Jesus was, and then he died, and then he came back. What are you going to do about it? That was the whole message. Every sermon, that's the whole message. It just never really changes. God was there. He sent Jesus. Jesus died. He came back. Now you got to do something about it. And again, it it, it is the answer to the thing that hangs over us all the time. I went to a, a restaurant the other night with my wife and our youngest daughter, and she's getting married here later this spring, and we all went out to eat, and her, her, her intended, and we all went to a, a crowded restaurant. I don't think of myself as an especially old person. I don't, but it's a crowded restaurant, and I don't hear that well in a crowd, which is fine. I'm not there to hear. I'll just eat while you all are talking, and I'm perfectly fine with that arrangement. I'm just eating in there all the time. But it's hard with the waitress. The waitress comes, and she's talking to us, and she's, I'm sure she's a college kid in Bloomington, and, and she's, she's talking to us, and, and I, ha- I don't hear her exactly. I had to ask her to repeat something, or I, or I, I got one thing wrong. I, I thought she asked something, but she didn't ask exactly what I thought she did. Well, by the end of it, she's actually leaning in. Hey, Dad, uh, what do you, you know, and she's, she's talking like I'm 100 years old. Would you like that pureed? And no, I don't want a pureed. I just want you to give it to me. Like, I'm, I'm not in 100. I'm just like, you know, prime of my life for crying out loud. But, 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 but again, but, but you feel the weight of it, right? You look yourself in the mirror and you're seeing wrinkles where you didn't see them before. You're seeing changes. You, you can tell you're getting older or you lose somebody. You know, somebody you thought would be around forever and now they're not. You know, we're all of us getting older every minute. And, and, and Jesus came back. He proved that he has power over death. And he proves that he can pull you through that. That's the trade. That's the trade that's been offered. That's the trade that the gospel's all about. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we can, in him, be the righteousness of God. At church camp, um, we, uh, there's a uh, ropes course. And it scares some people quite a bit. It, it, it's pretty tall in one part. You're, 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 you're about 30 feet off the ground, and they have you in this harness. I don't know why I'm like this. I mean, some people, I've told you before, I'm scared of flying. I, I can't explain it. You, you don't get to choose what you're scared of. Some guys are scared of uh, clowns or spiders or whatever else, but I, I don't like flying. But, 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 I, but for whatever reason, this ropes course does not bother me at all. They, they, they tether me into this harness, and they tell me that... Uh, Um, you know, this harness could hold a car. I reason to myself, I weigh a lot less than a car, so I'm completely unafraid of it. I'm swinging up there back and forth. It just doesn't bother me that much. I mean, there'll be moments when I look down and kind of tighten up, because you're up there pretty good, or or my my feet will give, and you instinctively kind of tighten up when that happens. But I I, I try to go on it every time I'm there. Now, last time I went on it, again, because I'm getting older, my big fear was not that I couldn't get through it, but that I would get through it so slowly the guys behind me would be mad. So that, that that has started to change my calculus. But again, I'm not worried of falling because i got this big tether on, right? I mean, it may look scary. It may look dangerous, but I'm going to be fine. I mean, I'm, I'm held up. That's what the resurrection is. I mean, that no matter what goes on in this life, no matter what you're hit with, no matter what you're, 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 you're smacked with, you're, you're held up by him. That ultimately, this life cannot take everything away from you. You know, if you've lived very long at all, sooner or later, you're going to get fired. Sooner or later, you're going to have somebody tell you they're mad at you. Sooner or later, somebody won't love you anymore. If you, if you, if you live life long enough, sooner or later, you're going to lose somebody who's valuable to you. Sooner or later, you're going to get bad news from the doctor that can't get better. And, and in all those moments, there will be this temptation to just crash in this pool of despondency, and yet you're held up by this tether. Christ died for you and came back. 
And because of that, ultimately, this life cannot take everything. It doesn't mean it can't wound you. It doesn't mean that life can't hurt sometimes. But, but no matter what bad news you go through, there's good news on the other side. And that's the trade that's offered to you today. And when you come into this place, we, uh, every Sunday, we encourage people who need to pray and call out to God to take advantage of this time, to just call out to Him. To pray either where you're at or to come here to the front where there will be people on both sides and pray with us. And they'll keep it real private. There will be somebody in the back has a name tag. If you want to go pray with them, they'll take you to a, 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 a quieter area of the building and you can pray. But just take some time. If you need to call out to God, if you need to have God in your life in a powerful way, do that today. There is no better Sunday than Easter Sunday, than Resurrection Sunday for you to get yourself right with God. All right, let me pray with you. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this group, and I do pray for them, God. I ask you to move in their lives. And maybe there are people here, God, who, who feel a million miles away from you, but you're as close as a whisper. I pray, God, if for anybody here who needs to to touch base with you, to know you better, to know you, God, uh, more intimately that you, that you call out and that, God, you give us the courage to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen.